Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Midlands. Welcome to the CBS Arena. Uh, as always, with post-match verdicts, we've got some lawnmowers in the background. Hopefully, you can all hear me. Uh, I'm sure you'll comment if you uh, if you cannot. Thank you, obviously, for for taking up time to to listen. I think after football matches, sometimes it can be really easy to deploy outcome bias. Uh, a result, you know, Norris, i.e., Norwich City win, therefore good. Norwich City lose, therefore bad. Um, and Norwich City draw, therefore meh. I think that's, you know, that's that's kind of what outcome bias is, come what may. I think there's, there's lots of elements, but the two key strands, how you analyse the performance result, ultimately, because that over the long term is what breeds success. But for me, it's always about looking at performances and about whether there's a sustainability in what Norwich City are doing, whether there's a long-term viability to what Norwich City are doing. Um, and that's why, if they would have hung on, and if they would have won 1-0, I don't think this verdict would change very much. And I think I'd be saying the same things. But I think it's, it's probably now kind of helped by the result to an extent. And, and those things can be completely different. You can win games of football when you are poor. You can lose games of football when you play well. Today would have been a perfect example of that if Norris City would have won 1-0. Um, and equally, you know, you can, you can take points from games that you don't deserve to. You cannot take points from games that you really deserve to. That's why we all love the sport, that unpredictable nature to it, that... I guess, non-scientific nature of it at points. Um, but I think over a long term, I'm certainly a believer in this, that if you get results in place and you get structures in place, results follow. And I think you've seen enough examples of that over the years at all levels to know that if you get the process right, if you get the performances right, results follow. Um, so I wanted to preface that by what I'm going to say, because I feel like I'm going to be, or perceived to be pretty negative and I know that that's maybe going to be met in some quarters by, oh, well, you wouldn't have said that if Norwich won 1-0 today. And I think I would have. I think I probably would have because I think a lot about these, and it may not seem like it, but I think a lot about what I'm going to say. Um, and I was basically preparing myself to say Norwich won, but goodness me, that was a daylight robbery. Uh, so let's, let's get to what I want to say, which is that Norwich City were really poor today. Really, really poor. Um, and they should have got beaten and should have got beaten pretty convincingly, I think. And there's a number of reasons that why they didn't, and I'm going to get into those. But, and this is why I talk about trends. I look at the trends of performance since Rotherham, uh, and I include Stoke in that and Birmingham in that. I, I said last weekend I wasn't that, that blown away by what they did against Birmingham. I thought it was kind of the perfect game for where they were at. But look, they beat the team that was in front of them fair play. Stoke, I felt, resembled a lot of today. I saw a lot of today in what I saw in, in, in that Stoke performance. Um, and they have unconvinced me for probably about over a month now. And to me, performances seem to be trending in, in, in one direction, and that's that's in a negative uh, direction, I'm afraid. I, I don't think Norwich have played well, certainly for prolonged periods, certainly for a game, for a significant portion of time, and that's a real concern. And I know people look at the league table after 11 games, and they see Norwich in seventh, I would counter that and say, look, they're, they're three points off third, absolutely. But they're also like two points off 15th. So what you see there is that, that that league table has not settled yet. You can read absolutely nothing into into what the league table is showing you. So you have to look at performances. You have to look for trends. You have to look for um, bits and, uh, and bobs. And actually, you know, I was sat in the second half and I was thinking, Norwich City came here in February. It was Wagner's second game in charge, I think. Uh, Coventry were a good side then. They had a good home record then. They had a good manager then. They had probably Gustavo Hamer and Victor uh, Geikeresh then. And Norwich City adopted a really different approach. Now, there's a hell of a lot of context to unwrap as to why that's completely different today. Uh, but it was really telling the difference in approaches. And I think it kind of sums up where they're at at the moment. And I'll get into more of that a little bit later. Um, but I, I think Norwich leave here, you know, start the car, get the point in the boot and, and get, get back down the A14 and A11 and, and get back to Norwich as quick as you can and, and don't let anyone question it because this was a, a point that Norwich City have earned. Sometimes, you know, you can frame games as our oh, two points lost or, or one game. This was a massively one game. And Mark Robbins said it in his press conference there. I agree with him. Coventry, if they were a bit slicker, if they, if they weren't as disjointed as they were in attacking situations, if... Ellis Sims and Hadji Wright would have took the, op the opportunities that opened up for them, particularly in the first half. Uh, they could have nicked it at the end. I don't think Norwich could have had any complaints if they did. But I, 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 I just wasn't 
pleased with, with how Norwich City approached that game at all, to be completely honest with you. Uh, let's start with the lineup because he made changes. He, he, he made the change to the back five. David Wagner took Jimmy Unulis out, put Sam McCallum in. I think in the expectation that they were probably going to have to be a little bit more solid defensively. They were going to need to be concentrated for long periods. Uh, Guajeta came in. Uh, Liam Gibbs came in. Adam Ida returned to the side. So that made, Norwich City made changes here, and that was for a, for a direct reason. And uh, Norwich City set up here today to contain to be effective in transition. But to be effective in transition, you need to be able to break a press and you need to be able to progress the ball up the pitch. And for vast periods, particularly the first half, Norwich City weren't able to do that. They didn't progress the ball very well. And you look at actually how they've done that this season. It's largely come from their left side, from the quality that Ben Gibson has on the ball. Doesn't defend very well at points, but on the ball, he, he helps massively with what they do from a build-up perspective. And Dimi Yanoulis, who um, I've been a critic of, for, for portions, but I think he's had an excellent start to, to the season. Completely a need for rotation, I understand that. But could that have come in, in different areas would be my question, because it affected how Norwich City were in possession, which was not great, to be completely honest with you. Um, they struggled to get out of their own half. Coventry dominated possession. Mark Robbins said there it's the first time that they had real spells of, of, of real possession and real dominance in, in a game. Um, and it, it kind of felt for vast periods of the first half like we were just all waiting for Coventry to take the lead. And look, fair play because I felt Norwich defended well and they defended the box um, well and they, um, their emergency defending, which Mark Robbins labelled at last ditch defending, was pretty good all in all today. And they, they protected their goalkeeper well, they defended central areas well, but they, they didn't have a, a, an outlet really. They didn't. Um, they weren't able to get out, they couldn't get up the pitch and, and that was a real problem in the first half and actually the one moment they did that uh, they scored and it was a real, really good bit of counter-pressing from, from Liam Gibbs who I, didn't, I wasn't that impressed with today um, but he counter-presses really well wins the ball, they, they catch Coventry in kind of a disjointed state Jack Stacey rolls the ball to John Rowe one touch and then the sheer power of the goal I, I think Wilson will probably reflect on it and feel he could do better uh, but he squirmed under him and it puts Norwich City in the lead and I actually felt they, they came out and, and managed the game OK in, in, in that kind of 20-minute spell. I thought that was largely due to Coventry's energy sapping, largely due to frustration as well. They started making poor decisions in possession. They weren't particularly connecting their, their attacking phases very well. And, and partly that is down to, to the way that Norwich City defended. But I've heard David Wagner speaking about killing off the game. I've got to be honest, Norwich never really looked like killing off the game. There was one cross from Sam McCallum that Adam Eder couldn't get on the end of. Liam Gibbs had a half chance as well, but there wasn't a stream of opportunities really that, that allowed them to do that. And then um, for the last 25 minutes, the management of the game is so poor, so, so poor. Norwich dropped so deep, they invite pressure, they don't manage the game as well as they did for the 20 minutes prior. Coventry were able to, to grow into the game. Mark Robbins made really good substitutions. Uh, Milan van Iwik, I'll probably pronounce that really terribly. He came on and gave them a different dimension. They swapped Sakamoto over to the other side. And Norwich really struggled to grasp with those opportunities. And because they went narrow and they, they wanted to defend in a deeper block, they invited space in wide areas. Coventry took that. They put crosses into the box. And when you do that, you invite mistakes. You invite swinging legs and, and heads in wrong areas. And that's exactly what they've done. And I, I, uh, you know, I feel for Ben Gibson to an extent because it's, it's, not, a great, it's not a great decision that he's made there. But... Uh, yeah, it was um, it, it was tough, and it, from there it, the momentum was was against Norwich. Coventry could have won it. Sakamoto had a had a header, I think, that was blocked by Gabriel Sara, uh, and and and, and uh, Milan uh, Van Iwick had a had a chance where he's played through the box and had a shot blocked by by Shane Duffy. And Coventry, I think, will feel they could have got a lot more here today. They haven't, and and I understand the context. There's there's a little bit of game state at play. Norwich City were ahead; they were protecting. But uh, I just never really felt that was sustainable. They needed a second goal. This game kind of showed that, and they never really looked like getting it. Um, and when you don't do that, you invite pressure, and, 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 and they're all getting, oh, away from home. Teams are going to push as well. And this feeds in, I think, to a wider narrative that at the moment, and this is why I think a lot of fans are, are frustrated, there's not a lot of long term that I see in this team or that I see in what David Wagner is trying to do. And I guess that that is um, kind of underscored by a lot of uncertainty off the pitch. Norwich has just appointed a new sporting director who's been changing ownership positions. Uh, you've got a sporting director still in post who's going to be here for a, a couple of months. 
none of this gives the impression that, well, all of it kind of gives the impression that it's a little bit of a club in limbo and it's not particularly stable and there's an instability to it. Um, and part of that is natural and part of that is understandable. But Wagner's on a one-year rolling contract, so there's not really been an indication yet that he is the one that the Norwich want to proceed with and that his plan is what they want to proceed with. And equally, all they've got at the moment is, is quite an old group. They, their average age has, has been the, the third highest in the championship. So there's no real idea of kind of process or end goal here. It all feels a bit now and short term and we need to win, we need to win, we need to win. And that's kind of reflected in the way that they approached this game today, which kind of felt like to try and control, to try and frustrate. And for a Norwich team that have aspirations of being in the playoffs and uh, getting out of this division, you have to be more than that. And I understand he's got attacking injuries, but I, I don't think that can shield as a mask to hide behind for anybody because I'm not sure that Norwich City with the, with the strikers and the trend of, uh, of the last few games, I'm not sure it makes a huge difference. It's impossible to know, ultimately. Maybe, maybe there's a different parallel universe somewhere where Josh Sargent and Ashley Barnes stay fit and Norwich City keep going. But there's not much depth in the squads, and this is where I do feel for, for David Wagner. When they make changes, they look poorer for it a lot of the time. But I mentioned this in the last week, I don't think it helps that they lurch to subs. They throw on two or three in one go and it, it disrupts structures and it, 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 they change things and it doesn't help. And, you know, they switch to a back three and two, minute, two minutes later, two, even if it was two minutes later, they, they concede an equalising goal. And then, uh, yeah, you're kind of stuck because you can't, you can't throw a centre back up front. So that's my feeling. I look at this at the moment and I go, well, I'm not quite sure how much of this is is building blocks for the future. You look at it, Angus Gunn, Norwich City's goalkeeper, undisputed for me. You've got Gibson and Duffy who are who are 30 between them. It's not old for centre-backs. Um, but I don't, I just don't see a lot of long-termism in what they're doing at the moment. And if there's that long-termism, I think you buy yourself a bit of time and you can, uh, you don't get the frustrated reaction that, that maybe supporters have at the moment because I'm not sure there's a real clear sense of direction. And I don't mean that in terms of on the field but just generally at the club I don't think there's a and, and that's natural I, I'm not it's not a critique of anyone because obviously things are changing and people are arriving and people are leaving so that that, that is a natural thing it wouldn't be right for Stuart Weber to come out and, and lay out a four-year plan for the football club when you know you've got a new guy coming in in a month's time who could rip it up and say we're not doing that we're not doing that we're not doing that I don't like him he's not going to be here so it's very difficult for the club to do that I just think it's it's symptomatic of where Norwich City are as a football club at the moment there's lots of change and it's natural because unstable football clubs and football clubs where there's lots of change, it does bleed onto the pitch. It's why you see very well-run clubs, as a general rule of thumb, do pretty well. And when clubs aren't are in that state and in that and then fluctuating, there you get this. And that's not a deflection to what we saw on the pitch today because Norwich made poor management decisions, um, poor structural decisions, and poor selection decisions, and poor approach decisions. So I'm not, I don't think that's a shield to hide behind either. But I think you throw all of these things into a cauldron and I think you create where Norwich City are at the moment. And I understand why people are saying, well, they're seventh and we take that. But it's being propped up by a good start when they had a lot of players, again, fit and, and, and there's lots of context to wrap into it. But the trend of performances they're on at the moment is not great, which is why this international break comes at such an important time for David Wagner and for the club, because it allows them to get bodies fit, although I... I would disagree. I know why they're sending Marcelino Nunez to Chile, but for psychological reasons, to try and pick him up a bit, it's very difficult. He's a foreign player. He's a, a long, long way from home. He's just been out injured. I'm sure there's a, a loneliness element to that. But if he thinks he gets injured on international duty, it doesn't help. So it comes at a right point. They can get some bodies fit um, and they can iron out, iron out the cracks. But for me, and I, I've said this for a while, and I think I predicted Norwich City to finish ninth at the start of the season. At the moment, I, I'm seeing a lot to kind of suggest that that is the case. Um, and, you know, I, I spoke to someone earlier who said, oh, it's a bit, it feels a bit like Daniel Farker's first season. And I, I get that, but that was Norwich City going, we've got a plan, this is our man, this is what we're building towards. I just, uh, and I think that's, this is why there's a little bit of distance from David Wagner and, and maybe not a willingness to completely connect with him because the feeling in the fan base is that he's a head coach that isn't going to be here very long. 
Um, and whether that's right or whether that's wrong and whether that's fair or whether it's not, that is the perception that is there at the moment. And so it feels like a football club where um, we're between eras at the moment. And that is kind of resulting in what looks to be at the moment quite a middling football team. And uh, they should have got beaten here today, again today, but they haven't. And, and it ends, and I meant I tweeted earlier, it ends their problems. I didn't mean that I ran out of characters, but it ends their run of away defeats. These are a good team, they're unbeaten at home. Just would have liked to see Norwich be a little bit more assertive and have a little bit more belief in what they're doing to go and attack the game. There's a lot of reasons why they didn't, there's a lot of context why they didn't. And I understand why David Wagner approached this game in the way that he did. I just think he got it wrong. I think uh, the management of the game, they got it wrong. And I would have said that if they won this 1-0, because I, I'm, this is not a sustainable way to win football games. I think we've all seen that over a long period of time as well. So um, there's my view. I don't want to be overtly negative because I recognise that we're still early into a season and stuff can uplift. But I think you have to be reflective of moods. And I, I can only say what I see. And I didn't see a particularly good performance. Um, and there will be points where Norwich City uh, lose games and I say, do you know what, they lost the game and they were, tr they were terrific today they took a point, they could have won it, they didn't uh, and I think they can, they can grab a point, take it on the bus and, and get themselves home and be very grateful for it and that for me is, is probably the biggest positive from today the fact that they've not lost the game and uh, maybe that's what you know, we should leave with on, on a positive note. There was a little bit of frustration in the away end towards the end. I think that all feeds into kind of what I spoke about earlier. Um, and obviously Ben Napper's in the building and, and he, starts, he starts work next month. And then I think we will probably all get a bigger picture of what the longer term looks like. At the moment, it feels like Norwich City are dealing in the currency of short term and um, bridging gaps. And I'm not quite sure how conducive that is to a really successful season on the pitch. So there we go. Time for an international break. I think we all need it. I need it after it's been a pretty relentless few weeks in terms of travel. Plenty more analysis, plenty more reaction over at Pinkin.com. Hopefully that hasn't been a massive ramble and there's been some elements of that that you can take and agree with and disagree with on a hear your thoughts as well. And um, yeah, we will see you again on the other side of the international break for the small matter of Daniel Farker's return to Carrow. From the CBS, from uh, Norwich City for a couple of weeks. Thank you very much for watching.